The colonial building was the seat of the Newfoundland and Labrador government from 1850 until 1959. During those more than 100 years, it was also the destination for countless protest marches, including one that took place on April 20, 1921. At the time, a post-war depression had made poverty widespread, so a group of unemployed workers marched to the colonial building to ask the government for help. Marching at the front of the parade was Julia Salter Earle, one of the most prominent labor leaders in St. John's. Her tireless efforts not only helped unemployed people find jobs, but also improved working conditions inside the city's factories and other businesses. Julia Salter Earle was born in St. John's on September 20, 1878. She was the twelfth child of parents Elizabeth and William Salter. When she grew up, she got a job with the Newfoundland and Labrador government. As scholar Helen Woodrow points out, the work helped prepare Salter Earle for her later involvement with the labor movement. She was employed for about 35 years as an engrossing clerk for the Legislative Assembly, preparing by hand for final endorsement every statute passed by the legislature. That job immersed her in the law, and she combined that legal knowledge with her skills as an organizer, negotiator, and writer in her attempts to help create a better world for working people. In 1903, Julia Salter married Arthur Earle, he was a jeweler on Water Street. Inside their home on Military Road, the couple raised six children together. Outside their home, they worked at their full-time jobs, and they soon became staunch supporters of workers' rights and the labor movement. It was during the First World War that Salter Earle's involvement in the labor movement escalated. Wartime inflation drove up the cost of living, but wages weren't always keeping pace. In 1917, an island-wide union formed to fight for workers' rights, like better wages, and an eight-hour workday. The Newfoundland Industrial Workers Association stated that it was open to all workers in any useful occupation. Soon, its membership included railway workers, longshoremen, coopers, bakers, and jewelers like Julia's husband, Arthur. He believed strongly in the union's work and soon became one of its executive members. By 1918, 3,500 workers had joined the NIWA. That summer, it opened a ladies' branch for women working in the city of St. John's. Although it was part of the larger NIWA, the ladies' branch was largely independent. It had complete control over its day-to-day -day activities, its finances, and its bylaws. It was also Newfoundland and Labrador's first union made up exclusively of women. And its president was Julia Salter Earle. She was voted into that role at the union's first meeting on August 9, 1918. At the end of that night, 60 women had joined the ladies' branch. That number jumped to 200 over the next three weeks. Most of the women who joined the union worked in factories. They manufactured a wide range of products, including clothing, shoes, fishing nets, twine, tobacco plugs, baked goods, and candies. The ladies' branch of the NIWA focused on four goals ending the use of child labor, winning higher wages for women, introducing sick pay, and bringing about an eight-hour workday. It also put pressure on government to make school compulsory for children. Julia Salter Earle publicized all issues by writing letters to the editor and publishing union reports in local newspapers. One appeared in The Evening Advocate on September 17, 1918, about a month after the ladies' branch had formed. It involved a 13-year-old orphan named Agnes Hickey. Her guardian forced her to leave school and work at a factory to pay for her room and board. This we know a right-minded public will call a crying shame, and we think it is quite time legislation is brought to bear against child labor. 
One has only to drop into the union meeting to see the condition of affairs. Many children who are there as union girls or wage earners should indeed be at school instead of having to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning to earn their bread. As a result of the union's intervention, the child was able to quit her factory job and return to school. There was much more work of this nature to be done. Unlike some other cities in North America and Britain, no laws existed in St. John's and indeed all of Newfoundland and Labrador protecting women and child laborers from low wages and long hours. Salter Earl calculated that women needed to earn $8.50 a week to pay for necessities like rent, groceries, and streetcar fares. The reality was that women and girls earned much less. Some only made $1.60 a week and were working 10 or even 12 hours a day. In November 1918, the ladies' branch of the NIWA organized its first two worker strikes. They had varying results. On the 20th, union members left their jobs to demand that workers at Browning's Biscuit Factory receive wages similar to bakers at Harvey & Company. But Brownings refused, and union members returned to their jobs after three weeks. A second strike had better results. After unionized workers at the Colonial Cordage Company protested the hiring of non-unionized workers to do similar jobs, management agreed that new employees must also join the union. More progress was made in 1919 and on two different fronts. Some factories introduced an eight-hour workday, while others introduced medical insurance for their staff. Despite the important nature of its work, though, the ladies' branch was short-lived. A post-war depression gripped the Dominion in the 1920s, and many factories laid off workers. With most of its membership suddenly unemployed, the ladies' branch declined, and in 1925 threw its support behind a new union, the Newfoundland Federation of Labour. That same year, Salter Earl once again made history when she became one of the first women in Newfoundland to run for political office. The first time that women on the island of Newfoundland could run for political office was the 1925 municipal election in St. John's. That year, 20 candidates competed for six seats on the city's council. Among them were three women, Fanny McNeil, May Kennedy, and Julia Salter Earl. Salter Earl ran as a labor candidate, and she adopted slogans that tapped into the trust she had earned as a labor leader. In the end, all three of the women were defeated, but it was a close call for Salter Earl. There were six seats that needed to be filled, and she came in seventh. Her defeat became shrouded in controversy after it was discovered that a ballot box in a key district had gone missing before the votes inside were counted. Eventually, though, the box was discovered, and a recount put Salter Earl within 11 votes of victory and of becoming the first woman elected to political office in Newfoundland. Salter Earl did not request a recount, but she did run for council two more times, in 1929 and 1943. Although she never did have a victory at the polls, Julia Salter Earl made an enormous impact on her society. She raised awareness of working class issues and helped improve working conditions inside the city's factories. She also challenged widely held assumptions about women's roles by serving as a labor leader and political candidate. She also left behind a legacy of compassion and kindness that endures to this day. Stories are still told about the ways in which she protected other city women. One day, seeing a distressed woman and her young children huddled together around some furniture on the street, she stopped and learned that the woman was being evicted. Julia Salter Earl asked for the name of the landlord, marched to his office, ordered him to send someone to return the furniture to the house, and told him the woman and her children must stay at the property until their economic fortunes changed. He agreed. Julia Salter Earl died on May 10, 1945, at the age of 67.